All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Haynes, and today I'll be talking to you about the Aztec and the Inca empires of the Americas. So, last time, when we talked last time, Dr. Ross established that in the early 1500s, the Ming China was the dominant power in Asia and, in fact, the strongest empire on planet Earth. But after the expeditions of Zheng He, after the expeditions of the Chinese mariner Zheng He in the 1430s, China decided to close itself off from the world. But China still manufactured all the coolest stuff in the world from gunpowder to paper, and Europeans still desperately wanted such products. And that desire motivated European maritime exploration. Dr. Ross also said that Portuguese, the Portuguese led early explorations, particularly of the African coast in the 1400s. And this resulted in Portuguese colonization of several island chains off the West African coast, the Madeiras, the Canaries, the Cape Verdes, and others. On those islands, the Portuguese built sugar plantations. And along the West African coast, the Portuguese traded for slaves to work those sugar plantations. So obviously this is sort of ominous foreshadowing of things to come. But the true focus for Portuguese mariners was to find a sea route to the Indian Ocean so they could trade for Asian spices, silk, porcelain, and other luxury goods. Vasco da Gama reached the Indian Ocean in 1497 and he conquered a string of seaports around the region, especially Calicut in India. Calicut here, the southern tip of the Indian subcontinent. And the Portuguese crafted a kind of protection racket in which they forced all traders moving through these conquered seaports to pay various fees and taxes. Now, as Dr. Ross also explained, a few years before Vasco da Gama in 1492, Christopher Columbus had sailed into the Caribbean on a different quest to reach Asian markets. And to convert the people he found, those non-Christian infidels, to Catholicism. But once Columbus reported the results of his exploration, Spain quickly became preoccupied with colonizing the Caribbean in a quest to get silver and sugar. Now, if you have not done so already, read closely the letter written by Christopher Columbus explaining his first voyage, describing it. As you read that document, ask yourself, what exactly is it that Christopher Columbus wants? He describes the fertile lands of Caribbean islands and many commodities available there. Ask yourself, what does he do while he's there? He's not merely exploring for the sake of exploring. He trades with the indigenous Taino people. He trades with the indigenous Taino people. But he also kidnaps people, captures an entire village, and builds what he imagines is an impenetrable fort. Ask yourself, what does he say about the native people he encounters? He says, they're cowards, they have no weapons, and they trade like idiots, he says. They're uh, 
too primitive to understand commerce. So, if you really think about the letter, you get a sense that Columbus and Vasco da Gama share a basic idea that Dr. Ross described last time. The age of exploration was also an age of conquest. Violence and commerce were intertwined from the beginning. So, in that sense, Vasco da Gama and Christopher Columbus really set the tone for the creation of a world economic system that would empower European states and lead to new forms of inequality. Now, of course, other Spanish conquistadors quickly followed in Columbus's wake in the early 1500s. They began by conquering a series of Caribbean islands, but they quickly turned their attention to the mainland. And that brings us to a couple of major questions. And I'm going to structure the rest of my remarks for the day around trying to answer these major questions. So, major question number one. What were some of the character-defining features of the Aztec and Inca empires. As I lay out these character-defining features, think about how they're similar, how they're different. And the second major question, how did Spaniards conquer these massive empires so quickly? So, When Spaniards found their way to the American mainland, they encountered larger, richer, more complex, and more militarized societies than those of the Caribbean. On the mainland, two great civilizations emerged over the course of the 1400s. Each of these civilizations boasted large cities, monumental architecture, and material wealth, including tons and tons of gold and silver. Mostly silver, but some gold too. And all that sophistication was underpinned by reliable agricultural surplus, mostly in the form of maize or corn and potatoes. So, those two civilizations were, of course, the Mexica, or Aztec, the Mexica, or Aztec Empire of the Valley of Mexico, and the Inca Empire of South America. Now, the Aztecs and the Incas, in addition to all their accomplishments, also had their own ways of war. The goal was often not to destroy all of the people encountered, but to take live captives and force enemies into giving regular tribute. Now, as you know from your textbook, as you know from your textbook, the Inca Empire at its height could field an army of 100,000 men armed with wood and stone spears, some metal, uh, some metal tipped spears, but mostly wood and stone spears and uh, carefully crafted, crafted war clubs. You don't necessarily need to know this, but they're typically referred to as Makana. So if you see that word, Makana, that's what they're talking about, war clubs. As well as bows and arrows. So the upshot is that these empires are large, highly militarized, but they have their own way of war. The Aztec and Inca empires' wealth made them really irresistible targets. 
or European conquistadors. But their military capabilities presented an insurmountable challenge to European forces. So, to conquer the Aztec and Inca empires, Europeans will need a lot of help. And as we shall see, they had all the help they needed. But, before we talk about European conquest, let's get to know those empires a little better. Let's talk a little more about their character-defining features. We'll start with the Aztecs. The Mexica people, known today more commonly as Aztecs, were actually relative newcomers to the Valley of Mexico. They had migrated into the region from northern deserts. We're not sure exactly from where, possibly from as far north as what we think of today as New Mexico and Arizona, but more likely from what we think of as today as northern Mexico. So they're relative newcomers to the Valley of Mexico. Around 1325, around 1325, the Mexica people settled on an island in a marshy lake, Lake Texcoco. Lake Texcoco. They settled on this island in this marshy lake, and they began a long, slow process of building their civilization. In 1428, in 1428, the Mexica people embarked on a series of dramatic conquests. And by 1500, by 1500, the Aztec Empire stretched from the Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico. It controlled as many as 28 million people in some 450 smaller city-states. Now, quick note, your textbook grossly underestimates the population of the Aztec Empire, four to six million, but that's, that's way too small. The population is much, much higher than that. In any case, in any case, in the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan, in the Aztec capital city of Tenochtitlan, you would find splendor and magnificence that matched any city in Europe. Tenochtitlan was home to between 200,000 and 400,000 people. That population made it one of the world's biggest cities at the time on the same scale as the likes of Istanbul. Tenochtitlan was also an engineering marvel, speaking to Aztec sophistication in the sciences. So for example, the Mexica built a series of dams and aqueducts to control the lake level. Now, in one of your primary documents for the day, the Broken Spears, in that primary document, Mexicas described flooding around the city as a bad omen that they believed sort of foretold the horror of Spanish conquest. But really, if you think about it, it's impressive that they use careful engineering to avoid constant flooding. The idea that flooding could be a disaster is a testament to their engineering skill. Tenochtitlan's, Tenochtitlan's spotlessly clean streets were lined with imposing stone temples and other buildings. And the city was surrounded by carefully constructed floating farms known as chinampas.
chinampas, these floating farms, are also sort of uh, an ingenious agricultural solution. Right? They've taken, they've taken a lake, a swampland, and turned it into a floating farm. Within the city itself, within the city itself, you would find a central marketplace full of an astonishing array of goods. All kinds of foods, plus luxury goods like cacao, chocolate, tobacco, and slaves. You would also be able to find other luxury goods made of gold, silver, and the feathers of exotic birds. So Aztec wealth was on display. So when you think about Aztec splendor, Aztec civilization, imagine how Europeans would have experienced it. The first Spaniards who entered the city had never seen a city so large, so beautiful, so clean. They were astonished. They gawped like hayseeds. The Aztecs were also a famously militarized society. They waged virtually constant war against other city-states around the Valley of Mexico. And when they won, they extracted tribute in food and goods, as well as war captives for human sacrifice rituals. Now, the Aztec Empire, politically speaking, politically speaking, the Aztec Empire was relatively decentralized. So they really rely on their fearsome military reputation to keep outlying city-states in line, keep the tribute flowing. So war serves a political purpose, but war was also central to Mexica religious practice. As your textbook points out, as your textbook points out, the Aztec origin story provides a kind of template for warfare and particularly human sacrifice rituals. In Aztec theology, the most important deity is the sun. And the deity, Huitzilopochtli, Huitzilopochtli, the deity Huitzilopochtli was the warrior of the sun. Rain deities were also extremely important in Aztec religion. If you think about it, that makes sense, right? Aztec splendor rested on the foundation of reliable food surpluses. Most importantly, maize, agriculture. So it makes sense that this society, dependent on agriculture, would deify the sun and the rain. Human sacrifice. Human sacrifice was the central ritual in Aztec religion. Human blood, human hearts, and human bone were offered to the rain and the sun deities. Human blood, human hearts, human bones were the fuel that kept the sun shining, the rain falling. The corn growing. Corn feeds the people. Corn is life itself. It enables life to continue. So, in a sense, in a sense, Aztec human sacrifice rituals were actually a celebration of the sanctity of human life. But, 
imagine how Europeans would respond to these human sacrifice rituals. Estimates vary, but Mexicas, Aztecs, sacrificed perhaps up to 80,000 war captives every year at their great temple in Tenochtitlan. Other supernatural forces required other kinds of ritual offerings, music, flowers, dancing, but also the flaying of human sacrifice victims, wearing their skins, and engaging in ritualistic cannibalism. When Europeans witness these kinds of rituals, they're horrified. Also, as you might imagine, this kind of brutality makes the Mexicas unpopular rulers at home. They're constantly at war. They sacrifice war captives by the tens of thousands, and they extract tons of tribute from their conquered enemies. Lots of the smaller city-states around the Valley of Mexico deeply resent the brutality of Mexica rule, Mexica dominance. So, when a tiny Spanish army appeared in the Valley of Mexico in 1519, they found lots of indigenous people eager to help them bring an end to Mexica dominance. Now, The Inca Empire, switch gears and think about the Inca Empire for a little bit. As we talk it through, I'll sort of draw your attention to some parallels between the Inca and the Aztecs, as well as some differences. The Inca Empire, the Inca Empire was the last and the greatest of a series of indigenous American cultures that flourished in the Andes Mountains of South America for some 3,000 years. The ancestors of the Incas settled around Cusco around 1200. Cusco, here, right along the spine of the Andes Mountains. So the ancestors of the Incas settled there around 1200, but beginning in 1438, under the rule of the Inca leader Pachacuti, the Inca rapidly expand their empire through violent conquest. For nearly a hundred years after 1438, Incas relentlessly and violently expanded. At its height, at its height, the Inca Empire ruled some 12 million people and controlled a territory that stretched some 3,000 miles from north to south. Their massive, highly organized empire was connected by a 25,000-mile road system. The roads are really the key. We'll talk more about them in a moment. Now, let's think about technology for a minute. There is no greater technology than writing. Neither Aztecs nor Incas possessed a true writing system, but both cultures had a complex mnemonic system, a system of symbols that allowed them to record vast amounts of data. So for example, the Inca use a system of knotted strings to track the population 
of their vast empire, and the amount of tribute they received uh, annually. So these knotted strings, or kipu, are today completely untranslatable. But the artifacts remain in museums throughout South America. So, they don't have a true writing system, but they do have complex mnemonic devices, ways of recording vast amounts of data that help them organize and govern their vast empires. In that sense, Incas have the same kind of problem that Aztecs have. They are violent conquerors. They have to govern millions of people who resent their dominion. So, if Aztecs do it through their sort of reputation as fearsome warriors and sort of the intimidation of executing tens of thousands of war captives, the Inca take a different path. The Inca forcibly relocate entire populations using their vast road network. So, after they conquer a given people, they would literally force thousands of conquered people to move to a different part of the empire. That sounds, if not brutal, certainly cruel to force people to sever all ties with their homelands and migrate en masse to a place they've never been before. However, Inca elites also worked with local leaders, sort of co-opting local elites. They allow local leaders to retain local control all they have to do is swear an oath of loyalty to the Inca leader and make sure that they deliver all the annual tribute in goods and also labor service. Now, Inca elites Inca elites use that forced labor system, that tributary labor system, to build their 25,000 mile road system. They use that labor to build cunningly engineered buildings. For example, the Inca built this place, Machu Picchu, as a summer palace for Pachacuti in 1450. Inca building is still revered today for its beauty and precision. All these buildings were constructed with what's known as dry stone masonry. Each stone block is cut to fit together with all the others so closely that you can't fit a sheet of paper between them. Yet, there's no mortar cementing them. The stones are laid one on top of the other, dry. Builders today still mimic the beauty and the precision of Inca masonry. But as I said before, the roads, the roads are the real key. It's the roads that allow people, goods, and armies to move around the massive empire quickly. Like the Aztecs, like the Aztecs, Incas also use religion to unify their empire. The city of Cusco and other cities around the empire staged elaborate ceremonies to indoctrinate subjects into the state religion. In that imperial religion, 
The leader was considered to be divine, the son of the sun. So in one of your primary documents for the day, you get a sense of that. In a document authored by Garcilaso de la Vega. In one of your primary documents for the day, the one authored by Garcilaso de la Vega, you get a sense of this idea that the Inca leader was considered divine, the son of the sun. In fact, Vega points out repeatedly that the Inca leader, Huayna Capac, Huayna Capac repeatedly refers to himself as the son of the sun. The sun is my father. So, like the Aztecs, the Incas worship a sun deity. Like the Aztecs, the Inca practice human sacrifice, though on a much, much, much smaller scale than the Aztecs. Now, despite their obvious achievements, the Inca were also facing some problems when the Spanish arrived in 1531. As your textbook suggests, as your textbook suggests, the Inca lacked a clear system of succession from one ruler to the next. So when an Inca ruler died, there was often a civil war to determine who the new leader would be. And again, your primary document for the day gives us some insight there. Garcilaso de la Vega also notes that when the Inca leader, Juan Capac, was on his deathbed, he commanded, he called all the nobles to him, he commanded them to be loyal and love his son, Atahualpa. So the Inca leader, Juan Capac, is on his deathbed. He knows he's dying. He tells all the nobles, this is my son, Atahualpa. He's going to be the new leader. Be loyal to him. Love him as you did me. But your primary document also notes that Atahualpa had hundreds of brothers and sisters. So in 1527, when Juan the Kapak died, a huge civil war broke out. Eventually, Atahualpa won. But the upshot here is that when the Incas first encounter the Spanish in 1531, they had just suffered through years of devastating civil war. In short, vulnerable. So, big picture. All of this shows that the Americas were home to remarkably populous, prosperous, sophisticated civilizations by the time they encounter Spaniards in the 1500s. But, both the Aztecs and the Incas were experiencing some real internal instability when the Spanish arrived. Aztecs had alienated millions of their subjects with their constant warfare, their staggeringly intense human sacrifice rituals, and heavy tribute demands. The Inca were mired in a civil war, and they too governed millions of people who resented some of their less savory practices, such as mass relocations. The arrival of the Spanish was the last straw for these massive, unstable indigenous empires. 
Now, I said earlier that the riches of mainland Latin America, the wealth, quickly attracted the attention of Spanish conquistadors. These men made their way to the Americas hoping to make their fortunes. When you think about conquistadors, think of Hernán Cortés as the poster boy. Cortez came from a modest, noble family with a history of military service. Cortez made a name for himself in the conquest of Caribbean islands, Cuba and Hispaniola. So, by the time we reach the year 1519, this guy is sort of a uh, an up-and-coming, self-starting, brutal fighter who already has a reputation gained in the conquest of Caribbean islands. So he gets the nod. He gets permission. He gets command of an invasion of the mainland. In 1519, Cortez invades Mexico. When he made landfall, he scuttled his ships. He sunk them intentionally. This was a plain message to his men. There is no retreat, like victory or death. Now, the Aztec emperor was aware of Cortez's approach. So he sent scouts to sort of check him out, see what's going on. Cortez only had about 500 men and barely uh, over a dozen horses, a couple of light artillery pieces. So the Aztec leader, Moctezuma, understood correctly. Moctezuma understood correctly. understood correctly that this tiny Spanish force of 500 dudes, some weird looking animals, and a couple of metal thingies, they're no threat to his empire of 28 million people with their fierce military reputation. However, Cortez soon gained crucial ally. At the moment of first contact between groups of people, communication is one of the biggest problems. How do you communicate with people when you do not speak a word of their language, they don't speak a word of yours? Cortez soon acquired a translator who became one of the keys to his success. To defeat an empire of millions, his tiny little army of 500 dudes will need a lot of allies. His translator, a woman named Malinke, Cortez's translator, a woman named Malinke, was given to him as a gift. Malinke helped him communicate with people who were fed up with Aztec dominion. Malinke helped Cortez recruit countless allies. So, how does Cortez's pitiful little army of a few hundred dudes conquer the fearsome Aztec Empire. Well, let's pause here for a second and do some image analysis to try to answer that question. How does Cortez's pitiful little army conquer this vast Aztec Empire? What if, what if this image 
was the only evidence you had to explain Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire. All right, so think about what you're seeing. On one side, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of Aztec warriors with their shields and their spears and their quilted cotton army. Armor, I should say, not army. But on the other side, okay, you got a few Spanish dudes, one guy with a firearm, a hark bus, one small artillery piece, and then a few people with steel shields, steel armor and helmets, steel-tipped lances, and then a few more dudes with crossbows shooting steel-tipped arrows. If this was the only evidence you had to explain the Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire, you might conclude, oh yeah, Spain had a technological weapons event. Better weapons, victory. That would be a reasonable conclusion if this was the only evidence you had. But what if this was the only evidence that you had? Okay, think about what you see here. Okay, on this side, you have a handful, a tiny number of Aztec warriors. On this side, you have a larger indigenous force, plus a couple of Spanish dudes on horses with armor, swords, and shields. If this was the only evidence you had to explain Aztec conquest, you might conclude that it's actually Cortez's indigenous allies that allow Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire. The tiny army of 500 Spaniards, plus countless indigenous allies, managed to overwhelm, to outnumber the Aztecs. But then, what if this was the only evidence you had to explain Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire? Then what would you conclude? the most important contributor to Spanish victory, Spanish conquest, was not steel weapons, and most certainly was not firearms. It was first and foremost the disease smallpox. Second, it was indigenous allies. And then a very distant third, steel weapons. Cortez found lots of allies fed up with Aztec brutality. The Spanish way of war was also a little bit strange to Aztecs. They were initially unprepared for it. For them, for Aztecs, the goal is to take war captives who will later be sacrificed um, to Huitzilopochtli these massive human sacrifice rituals. For the Spanish, the goal in combat is to slaughter everything that moves with firearms and far more importantly, horse-mounted cavalry carrying steel-tipped lances and steel swords. Now, how does this all go down? I'll conclude with a quick story of how this all shakes out in the city of Tenochtitlan. The Aztec leader, Moctezuma, knew the Spanish were coming. He sent out scouts to check them out. He correctly concluded they were no threat. So Moctezuma initially welcomed Cortez and the Spaniards into the city. Although, Moctezuma's uh, nobles, his advisors who surrounded him, warned him this was a mistake. They never trusted Cortez. They always saw him as a threat. And they were right. 
The Spaniards quickly took Moctezuma hostage inside his own palace. Spanish troops massacred a crowd inside the central square, the central marketplace. And so the Mexica people rose up en masse. They drove Cortez and his pitiful little army out of the city. They did manage to capture several of Cortez's soldiers and sacrifice them to Huitzilopochtli. But when Cortez and his men were driven from the city, they left behind smallpox. The disease whipsawed the entire valley of Mexico, killing a third of the population within just a few months. Indeed, that epidemic, that smallpox epidemic, reached all the way to the Inca Empire in modern Peru by 1528. So when the Inca first encountered the Spanish in 1531, not only were they in the midst of a devastating civil war, they were also being devastated by the disease smallpox. Now, smallpox is a horrifying disease. All right, imagine if one out of every three people that you know died in the course of just a few months. But that level of demographic collapse is kind of hard to fathom. When that kind of devastation occurs, Basic services break down. And food production staggers to a halt. There's no one left to run the government, to serve in the military. Famine follows, making people even more vulnerable to the disease. And of course, ultimately, to Spanish conquest. When Cortez re-entered the city of Tenochtitlan, he found it in ruins. A population too weak to resist. Cortez took over the Aztec Empire. He declared it a Spanish colony. He appointed a governor and renamed it New Spain. So, what are the immediate consequences for the Mexica people? Cortez rewarded his loyal followers with encomiendas. Encomiendas. Essentially, an encomienda was the right to extract forced labor and tribute from a certain number of indigenous people. And you can get a sense of that in this graphic, right? This is um, a graphic depiction of an encomienda. Think of it like a tax receipt, right? This particular community owes, you know, so many sheaves of grain, so many uh, forced laborers, so much military service to a Spanish leader, a Christian leader. So Cortez awards encomiendas to his loyal followers. And he dispatched expeditions to conquer all of the other city-states throughout the valley of Mexico. In short, the successful conquest and colonization of the Aztec Empire, and a few years later the Inca Empire, transformed the Americas and Spain. Indeed, colonization transformed the entire world. This is one of the crucial early steps in creating a world economic system that will boost the power of the Spanish state 
and create new forms of inequality in other places in the world. Next time, I will continue sort of sketching the contours of early colonization in the Americas and the consequences of colonization. So, we'll pick up there next time. Thank you.